Hello, I'm Adam Pascoe and welcome to Adam's Gardening Guides. Today I really feel that spring is in the air, so welcome to my garden in the East Midlands here in the United Kingdom. I've got lots of gardening jobs to cover today, some tips and ideas to spring into summer and get your garden as productive and as colourful as it can possibly be for the months ahead. Isn't it wonderful when the garden starts waking up in the spring? Crocus have provided some of the earliest flowers and signs of spring. And these have been joined by the early daffodils bursting into bloom and I've added these patches of gold to my flower borders too, soon to be followed by a lovely display of tulips. New growth is surging up in the borders with hardy perennials poking up their new shoots among the daffodils and alliums pushing through to layer on some extra colour and these alliums will be in flower during June. Some of my camellias are in full bloom like the glorious compact camellia contribution and alongside it skimmier Q white has developed some bold clusters of buds and these will soon open into pure white flowers as we move through spring. My hellebores are now at their best through February and into March. Some can be a little bit later and the neighbouring snowflakes grow well alongside them in this bed in the dappled shade. And all around the garden the buds are fattening up, swelling up and bursting into leaf. Coming up, why not plant some lilies to provide pots of full fragrance and colour in your summer garden? Sow tomato seeds to raise your own plants and enjoy your own homegrown tasty tomatoes. Now that the worst of the winter weather is hopefully over, it's time to prune away those dead flower heads on your hydrangeas. Congested pots of hostas can be divided and rejuvenated. Sow some pots of baby salad leaves for an early harvest. And there's much, much more in this video today, but let's get started with lilies. These are a range of rose lily double flowered lilies and aren't they absolutely glorious? I've got a mixture of different name varieties here and these doubled flowered ones are so impressive with layer after layer of beautiful petals that open to reveal the fragrant blooms. Lilies are a really easy bulb to plant in patio pots. Now you'll find lily bulbs available in garden centres or from mail order suppliers early in the year. You might even be able to place your orders during the winter months but you'll get the lily bulbs delivered probably in those early months of the year, late winter, early spring, February, March or April and they can be planted up straight away. Some people might plant their lily bulbs in their borders. Some people like me will plant them in patio pots and I love them in pots because you can then move the pots around the patio to give you different displays during the summer months. Now lilies will usually come into flower around about the middle of summer from June into July, July into August and give you a lovely succession of flowers and if you want flowers for a longer period of time just grow a range of different varieties. You could put mixtures in pots like this or you could just grow one variety in a pot to give you a really impressive display. I love growing my lilies in large terracotta pots. I find terracotta is a weighty stable material so if you're growing tall varieties of lilies like these rose lily from double flower varieties then the plant has got more stability. I line the inside of terracotta pots with some old pieces of compost bags, some old bits of plastic that you might have lying around or an old compost bag, cut it into little pieces, place those and line the inside of the pot before you fill it with compost. Don't cover over the drainage holes in the base of the pot, but if you line the inside of the pot with plastic, it stops the compost losing so much moisture during those hot summer days so the compost retains the moisture for longer. Then I fill with compost, just a good multi-purpose compost will do. Plant several lilies in each pot, depending how big the pot is you might find that there's room for five or six or seven lily bulbs. Plant generously to create a really impressive display. Plant bulbs with a root plate downwards and the shoots pointing upwards 
and plant them deeply so the bulbs are covered to about three times their own depth in compost. This supports the tall flower stems as they develop and some varieties even produce roots from these stems so they've got extra rooting support too. Then you can leave the pots out on your patio if you want to speed up growth you could plant them up in let's say March or April time in your conservatory or greenhouse and get the bulbs growing more quickly. Keep the pots well watered. In the summer when the lily bulbs are growing up strongly I usually stand my terracotta pots in a saucer of water which I can top up each day so the pot has got a reservoir of moisture to take up on those hot days of summer. Just keep them well watered. Tall varieties I find are quite stable and they don't need staking but if you have got some rather top heavy plants then put some stakes or some canes in and tie up the plant for support but this rose lily variety is very stable I haven't had to stake it at all and it's created a really nice display the taller the display you can move these pots to the back of your patio pot display if they're shorter varieties you can have them at the front and just enjoy week after week of glorious flowers Now I grow hydrangeas in several of my pots and these need pruning. Taking off the old flowers, just go over the plant carefully. Just shoot by shoot, go over, trim them back with your secateurs. As I say, I usually start by pruning down to maybe the top buds or the buds just below that, the leaf buds there, the green ones just fattening up through spring looking like they're full of promise of flowers for the summer ahead and just take your time going over the whole shrub just remove them one at a time and then step back take another look trim a few more back open up the center of the shrub to remove any very congested shoots which are in there that will make a little bit more space for those nice green shoots to grow up from the base either the base of last year's growth or right the way down at the bottom of your hydrangea, there's new shoots which are developing there, which will grow up and give you the flowering stems to carry blooms in future years. When frost is forecast, the one job I have to do is to get my fleece out in the evening and cover up this lovely camellia at night. When it's warmed up in the morning, I can remove it. But I put a layer of fleece over the camellias or rhododendrons in this raised ericaceous bed. This is the lovely camellia contribution, a nice compact slow growing camellia and I just put a piece of fleece over it at night just to keep the frost off. A layer of fleece acts like double glazing. Put this over the top at night, take it off in the morning and this stops the blooms getting frosted and hopefully keeps the display going for longer. I'm a great fan of hostas. I've got lots of them in my garden, mainly growing in pots. Their big, broad leaves provide colour and interest right the way through from spring to autumn. This is the time to divide them. So let's get started. Here's my really congested pot of hosta nigrescens. It's in a terracotta pot. And the first thing I'd say is if you are growing hostas in pots, do try and grow them in a pot of this shape so that the plant will come out easily. I have made the mistake in the past of putting my hostas into more oval pots and they're impossible to remove when the roots have completely filled the pot. So tip it out. I've just spread a sheet onto the ground so I can keep the area tidy. Tip the whole root ball out and you'll notice new shoots at the top coming down with roots below and each of these little bits will form a new plant. What I tend to do is to cut off, I use a sharp knife of some sort, just cut off little portions, each with one, two, three or more shoots and some roots attached. So cut through the root ball very carefully, take your time. You can discard the central portion of the clump if you want, but these outer portions are the healthiest. They're the younger pieces. The plant's grown outwards towards the edge of the pot and these nice pieces are perfect for potting up. Just take your time and after a while you would have divided the whole clump up into portions. If you do think the older section of the clump 
it's a bit woody and it's not very productive, then you can discard it. But quite often one big pot of hosta will easily make, what have I got here? One, two, three, four, eight or nine pieces. You can divide them into small pieces, you can divide them into bigger pieces, but just take your time and you will have some lovely pieces of hosta to replant and rejuvenate. I put a layer of grit in the base of the pot really to improve drainage. Just a good layer a few inches deep ensures that the drainage hole at the bottom of the pot isn't blocked and any excess water will easily drain away. So good layer of gravel in the bottom and then what you can do is line the inside of the pot with some plastic. Now I do this in terracotta pots because terracotta is a porous material and it can dry out very quickly during the summer. So I just cut up some old pieces of compost bag and I line the inside of my terracotta pots, not blocking over the drainage at the bottom, just line the sides. A good multi-purpose compost with some loam in it, uh, joining this type of compost mixed in. This hosta is gonna sit in the pot for several years. So you want to have a compost which has got some guts to it, which has got some heart. And for that, it's going to need some loam. Loam is really a bit of material like soil. The next thing I do is mix in some slow release fertilizer. These little fertilizer granules will slowly dissolve to release their nutrients over time. So I sprinkle in and mix in good handful of that to make sure there's some nutrients in the compost. So when the roots grow down from these little hosta bits, they'll have some nutrients to feed the plants. Then start planting. Just take the portions, settle them down into the compost, keeping the level of the compost about level with the rim of the pot. You want to plant them about the same depth as they were in their original pot. A little bit deeper would be fine, but certainly no shallower. And just gradually space these portions out around the pot, getting the roots deep down into the compost so that they'll grow down. And then a few handfuls of compost pushed in around the sides. At this stage, just to hold them upright, we're just going to position the pieces here and work out how many pieces little portions of hosta we can fit in this particular part. Fill in around with compost, just push it down with your fingertips and what you'll do is to water to settle the compost in but at this stage just push the compost down around each little individual piece of hosta and just firm it down keeping the shoots pointing straight upwards and getting the level of the pieces just about right. And now all that's left to do is water. Water from above, good drenching of water. This is really going to settle the compost down around those pieces of hosta. If it looks like you've got some gaps and you can fill in with more compost, but really good drench of water to settle the compost. And that's all there is to dividing up a congested hosta. I really hope you're enjoying this video and if you are please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel it really does help me to develop more videos so a thumbs up and a subscribe would be very very welcome thank you and spring really does bring the Midas touch into our garden starting of course with golden daffodils an array of different shapes and flower colors to enjoy then there's trees and shrubs too. Forsythia is one of the earliest flowering shrubs, grown as a shrub in your borders, or maybe clipped and shaped to form a flowering hedge down the side of your garden. Then there's the beautiful Acacia dialbata, a magnificent tree covered during March with these golden pom-poms of bloom cladding the evergreen stems of this lovely tree. My neighbour's got this in the front garden and doesn't it look spectacular? And moving through spring, I've got a lovely hardy evergreen shrub called Sophora Sun King, who's hanging golden blooms open to produce a glorious display of flowers with the bees adore feeding on too. So if you want a touch of gold in your borders, 
check out the golden flowering shrubs that you could include in your garden now. If you care for your daffodils, they can easily flower the following year. So keep your spring bulbs watered and fed. And once flowering is over, don't let the bulbs waste energy forming seed heads. Instead, pick those seed heads off and let the bulbs die down naturally. You want all of those food reserves to go down into the bulb. So don't cut off green foliage, allow all your bulbs to die down naturally. And hopefully the food will have stocked up the bulbs so that they'll have a good supply and the bulbs will be a good size to flower again in future years. The flower buds are swelling up beautifully on my rhododendrons. This one is a dwarf compact variety called Rhododendron Yakushimainum and this will burst into bloom around about the time of the Chelsea Flower Show here in the UK which is about the third week in May. So the buds are swelling up, those will be developing through the spring and bursting into beautiful pink bud and white blooms to enjoy just at the end of May. And to keep the growth of rhododendrons, camellias, pieris, azaleas and so on healthy, don't forget to give them a feed with an ericaceous plant food. My shrubs here are grown in a raised ericaceous bed, an acid compost bed, but giving them an acid plant food, an ericaceous food, make sure the leaves stay healthy and this shrub will flower year after year. I grow lots of things in my patio pots to provide winter interest. The Gaultheria or Panettia had berries and that's now finished burying but I've just left with the evergreen leaf. But its neighbouring plant, Skimia japonica rubella. It's a male form of Skimia and the flower buds have looked colourful over winter. As we move into spring they burst open into these beautiful bold heads of bloom. And its companion in this pot is one of my favourite euphorbias or spurges. This is Euphorbia ascot rainbow with the most beautiful variegated golden leaf which looks colourful all year round now coming up and producing its display of flower heads which will soon burst open into those lime green flowers. Euphorbias are a lovely shrub to have in the garden. Ascot rainbow can stay in this pot all year round or you could plant it in your borders. Once the flowering stems have finished flowering I'll prune those right the way down to the base and new shoots will come up from the bottom to replace them, look colourful all year and carry flowers again next year. As we move through from winter into spring the lawn will start growing apace especially with the damper warmer weather as we move through spring. It's important to give it its first cut of the year but do set the blades of your lawnmower that little bit higher. You shouldn't cut it too low or it will put the lawn under a great deal of stress. Just give it a light trim. So I'm setting my blades about two inches tall, about five centimetres long, raising up the deck of the mower and then I can trim over the grass which is actually getting quite long. Now it's growing strongly, really is time to give it its first cut of the year. Cutting up and down the lawn, trimming the grass back but not too short and then I can put all of those clippings onto my compost heap, mix it in with other kitchen and garden waste and rot it down into homegrown compost. So get the mower out, raise the blades up and give your lawn its first cut of the year. Now I like to compost as much of my kitchen waste as possible and while I often add it to my worm bins and my compost bins another thing you can do during the winter months is to take your kitchen waste and use trench composting to break it down. So in this bed I'm probably going to grow a moisture a dependent crop this summer like courgettes or beans. This is a perfect bed to choose for trench composting. All I'm going to do is to take out, start at one end of the bed and take out a trench of soil. Just about a spade's depth is going to be fine. About eight or nine inches deep. Just take out one whole trench of soil. Uh, 
there you are, that's about it. About a spade's depth deep, right the way across the bed. And now I make about a bag of peelings from vegetables and fruits every other day in my garden. And all you've got to do is to sprinkle this old tea bags, fruit skin, anything like that can be tipped along the bottom of the trench. Crushed up eggshells are fine too. Leave that down there. Now I'm going to bury it. So you then start your second trench across the bed and you turn that soil over onto the old vegetable waste that you've put in the trench. And the idea is that that old vegetable material, I haven't rotten it down in the compost heap, this will break down naturally in the soil and the worms and the soil organisms will start feeding on it. But that will break down. So I take out the second trench. About the same depth, depth as the uh, the first one then I can get some more of my vegetable peelings some bits of old veg and fruit skins and so on can go in there and now I bury that to start your next trench along and you bury it down you could just continue from one end of the bed to the other and the buried material rot down and because I'm going to plant out my crops on top of this bed for the summer. The roots of the marrows and courgettes and beans, whatever else I plant on here, will delve down into that lovely organic matter that I've buried down at the bottom underneath them. And those will get down into these old fruit skins and bits and pieces. The roots will get down into it and the organic matter which locks in moisture and produces lots of nutrients will sustain the crop during the summer. So just continue down the bed, taking out a trench, putting in some vegetable material, burying it, then you can level the surface of this bed and it will be ready for the spring. So the last one I've got here today, just one more bag to put out today. I can continue the rest of this over the, the coming weeks. This old material can be spread out, buried down at the bottom here. This will just provide some lovely rich organic material for worms like this to delve down into and feed on. And it adds some organic matter for free, saves me buying another bag of compost. All of that matter will break down. So it's buried nicely with a few inches of soil. I'll be planting into that in the spring. The roots will get right down into that rich organic matter and sustain the crops through the summer months. I've grown this lovely dahlia called Pink Princess in this container for a couple of years now. All I've done in the autumn is to stop watering. I've brought the pot into my greenhouse and now during the winter I can just gently clear these stems of last year's growth away. If you need to you can cut them off at the base but most of them I find are just sort of pulling away nicely. There's a few plant support canes in here as well which I used to support the dahlia as it was growing up last year. But all of these can now be sort of cleared away. The tuber, the dahlia tuber will be sitting in the pot. And I'm just going to leave this now and wait until the spring and see, hopefully, new shoots growing up. If I just clear away a little bit of soil now, I can see the tuber here just below the surface of the compost, little bits of the tuber here. So I've probably got a really nice tuber in this pot. I'm going to take the canes out that supported the plant last year and leave this in here. Hopefully in a few weeks time I'll see the first little green shoots coming up and then I can maybe top dress this with some fresh compost. If you want to do that 
you can literally, all oh, look, I found a little snail hiding in there. There's a couple of little snails, just worth checking in your pots, see if you find these snails. As I say, if you want, you can just clear away some of the old compost from the top and top dress it with some fresh compost. But I should get new growth and I'll get my dahlia coming back into growth and flowering again this year. In fact, I'm going to do that now. Just take away probably a couple of inches of compost from the surface of the pot. And look what I have found. Apart from some worms in here, I've got some vine weevil grubs. So here's some little worms in the compost, which won't be doing any harm at all. But under this dahlia here, I found another one just now. Here we go. Just a, these little creamy C-shaped bugs. They're the larvae of the vine weevil. These will be eating away at the roots or the dahlia tubers in the compost, feeding away. And these will hatch out into the adult vine weevils later in the year. I believe all the adults are female, so they've all got the possibility of both feeding on plant leaves and laying eggs. So actually, rather than just top dress this compost, now I'm going to empty it out, make sure I don't find any more little vine weevil in here and repot the fresh tubers. Right, because I have just found a couple of little vine weevil grubs in the compost of this uh, pink princess dahlia. I am going to tip out all of the compost now and obviously any worms can be saved. Yet another vine weevil grub. Put these over here. Let's just see yet another one. Yep this has been really infected by vine weevils over the summer. So although I can see just exposing the um, the dahlia tuber here, I can see there's a few vine weevils in here. And also, I don't like having, oh, another vine weevil. I don't like having worms in my pots because I think they can disturb the roots. So I'm going to take those out and save them, put those back in my beds at the same time. Actually, this tubers. Yeah, little one. This tuber is quite big, but vine weevil means roots being nibbled. So I'm now just going to take all of the compost away. There we go. Now I've just loosened the tuber. I think I've got two dahlias in here, some lovely big worms in here as well. And so far, I have found yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, a dozen little vine weevil grubs. I'm really pleased actually that I did start looking at the compost and um, seeing what I could find. This really does need to be repotted. So I was just thinking of just keeping these dahlias in here for a second year, but now I've found lots of worms in the pots and also the vine weevil grubs. I'm going to clean off these dahlia tubers, which still look good and solid. I'm going to rinse the soil off these with water. Just make sure there's one there. Just make sure there's no other little vine weevils hiding. There's the main stem. So clean these off and then I can replant these uh, dahlia tubers into some fresh compost. The alliums are coming up nicely in my borders. I like planting alliums where they'll grow up in amongst other lower growing perennials. This is Allium Globemaster. Been in here a couple of years now and I've just got some groups of these towards the front of this little flower bed here. So they'll grow up and give me some beautiful flowers around about June time. If you haven't planted any alliums yet, then you can plant the bulbs in pots in the autumn to grow them on into rooted 
plants and then plant those out where you've got some gaps in your borders. But once they're established, you just let them die down naturally in the borders and they'll grow up. Hopefully the little clumps of bulbs will get bigger by the year too. And these will give you some lovely summer flowers. This is a handy little euphorbia or spurge called euphorbia macinities. I grow this alongside my garden path. It's a low growing perennial but as we're coming through into spring it's already starting to produce these lovely lime green flowers and as I say I plant it right at the front of the border so those stems will spread out with their lovely glaucous foliage and they'll give you a wonderful spring display of flowers too. A really useful sun-loving, heat-loving euphorbia to grow in a sunny position right at the front of the borders alongside your drive or here in my garden alongside my paved path. Hellebores are lovely aren't they? coming up in late winter giving you some really early flowers to enjoy in your garden and there's some beautiful varieties on the market more coming along every year to choose from have a look in your garden center and see which varieties you can find to add some really early displays of color to your own borders i've got mine planted in my shade border if i show you now I've got a silver birch tree, no leaves on it at the moment as we're in February coming to early March but the new leaves will be unfurling soon and right at the bottom here past the Viburnum tinus winter flowering shrub in the shade border here I've got the lovely display of hellebores giving you some early flowers and as I say, if you want to add some new colours, some new varieties, some of those beautiful double forms perhaps, then check out the varieties in nurseries and garden centres and put them in a sort of woodland type garden is perfect for them. And I let a lot of mine just flower. Once I finish flowering, I let them set seed and then the seeds will fall and I'll get new little seedlings growing up around the borders. I can leave some of those and I'll produce more flowering plants to enjoy in future years. I've got a nice variegated Escalonia in my border which you can trim over and keep to size but on some of these variegated forms they have a nasty habit of reverting back to plain green and here we have it a plain green shoot just coming out which you need to either snap away at its base completely or prune off. If you leave these green shoots in place, then sometimes they can be much more vigorous than their variegated counterpart and they can start taking over. So check your evergreen shrubs, particularly your variegated ones through winter. And if you spot any plain green leaves, remove them completely. There's another one just here again, just follow that back down you can prune it away or just literally break it off completely. There are a wide range of flowers, vegetables and herbs that we can grow at home every year and many of them can be grown from seed. Now when you're growing from seed you can sow a number of ways. Uh, you can use a windowsill, you can use a greenhouse like I've got here maybe with a heated propagator if you're sowing very early in the year and you can sow seeds into either pots Small pots are great. You can sow seeds individually or you might sow a number of seeds together in a larger pot. Or you can use what are called modular seed trays, which is a seed tray which has got lots of individual modules in, fill it with compost and sow seeds in those. But today I'm gonna to use a slightly different technique. I'm gonna sow my seeds into little coir pots. Now these fiber pots come as compressed pellets like this and all you have to do is soak them in water to make them increase in size. You just get the pellets themselves, put them in a tray, add some water in the bottom of it and within 30 minutes or an hour the pellets have soaked up in size. They've reached this sort of size and then you can sow the seeds individually into them. Now when you sow into these little pots 
you'll get a little seedling or group of seedlings. These are some calendulas. I sowed two seeds in each koi pot and you can see I've got a nice little clump of seedlings to plant straight into the garden. Or you can use it for growing crops, tomatoes, all sorts of other things. And these little tomato plants have been growing for a few weeks now. And look, the seed germinated and I've got a beautifully strong tomato plant here to pot up individually and grow on to give me summer crops either in the greenhouse or out in the garden. You can just leave these modules overnight to absorb moisture and once they're up to this lovely full size just make a little dimple in the top of each of these modules that's where I'm going to put the seeds. You just need to make a little bit of a dimple in the top. Then I can get my seeds and I'm sowing a tomato here called Gardener's Delight. And I literally have to pop one seed into the top of each module. Now, if your seeds are very affordable, you could put two seeds in each module. Cover up the top. And what you can do once you've sown the seeds is to put the seeds on a windowsill or in a propagator, somewhere warm. What they need is warmth. The blocks themselves are moist and we're just going to water them a little bit every day just to keep those blocks moist. The seed needs moisture, it needs warmth, and then the seedling will germinate. Once it's germinated, of course, it needs good light as well. Now, after about perhaps 10 days or two weeks, those seeds will have germinated. And here's some I sowed a couple of weeks ago, and you can see these have germinated into beautiful little tomato seedlings. I can already see the roots growing out of the bottom of these Koya fiber modules. I put two seeds in this little module. So what I could do now, I know both seeds are germinated. I can remove one of the seedlings. That was just basically my little guarantee, my safety measure. I didn't want to waste time sowing one seed and then it didn't germinate and then you've wasted two or three weeks. So now I know both have germinated. I can literally whip that seedling out. I don't need it, I can throw it away and that little tomato seedling I will grow on over the next few months planted in the greenhouse or outside if you've got an outdoor tomato variety to grow crops this summer. So these little tomato plants have been growing for a few weeks now and look the seed germinated and I've got a beautifully strong tomato plant here to pot up individually and grow on to give me summer crops either in the greenhouse or out in the garden. Now you'll see little roots growing out through the sides of the coir pot, which means they're ready for potting up into probably a three, maybe a four inch pot. Use a multi-purpose peat-free compost, layer of compost in the bottom of the pot, then fill in around with more compost. You can bury the base of the stem of the tomato. That's absolutely fine. It will send out roots into the compost from there, but keep those seed leaves just proud of the soil surface. Firm well with your fingers, and then you can water it in well. And just repeat that for all the rest of your tomato plants. A good multi-purpose compost is essential. Layer in the bottom of the pot, just an inch or so, then pop in the little tomato plant which you've raised in your coir pot. Put that down, firm it in the center of the pot itself, filling around with more compost. And this will grow on, and this is all you really need to do to grow the plant on. Once it's filled that pot with roots, you can plant it up or plant it out in the garden. Firm well, water. Now I keep these in the greenhouse and grow these on for a few more weeks until they're ready to plant out. Now I have to say, just going back to seed sowing for a minute, that I find sowing tomato seeds in little coir pots is a really easy, simple, foolproof way 
of raising plants and avoids what is called pricking out. But let's cover the traditional way of sowing seeds for a minute. If you want, you can get some small pots, maybe a three inch pot, fill it with a seed sowing compost. Fill it right up to the top and then level the surface of the compost. And then you can put a little layer of tomato seeds over the top. Not one seed in each pot, but put perhaps six, seven, eight seeds over the surface of the compost. Just tap them down gently. Then cover the seeds lightly. Now, if you want, you can cover the seeds with the seed sowing compost, but I like using vermiculite. It's a dry material. You'll buy it in bags from your garden center and it's very easy to cover small seeds thinly, just with a very thin layer. So cover the seeds with the vermiculite and then water. I start by watering from the top and you'll notice that the vermiculite turns a deeper colour, but then you can rest the pots in a tray of water and let the compost soak up as much moisture as it needs. If you want, you can stand the pot in water from the beginning and once the water has soaked up to the top of the pot, you'll notice the, the vermiculite turning a deeper colour. Then I cover the pot with some clear kitchen film. This is just to conserve moisture and stop the surface layer of the compost from drying out. Putting the pots in a propagator could do the similar job and also you could just put a piece of uh, polythene or glass over the top of the pots. But I find that covering each pot individually with this plastic wrapper is an ideal way. And you can keep an eye on the pots every day and as soon as you notice the first signs of a seed germinating, you can take this layer of plastic away. Place these in a warm place. A warm windowsill would do, but I've got a heated propagator that I can set to a temperature of about 21 degrees, and that it will encourage good seed germination. Usually within seven to 14 days, the seeds will germinate, then remove the plastic from the top of the pot leave those seedlings to develop. And as soon as each seedling has produced its first true leaves and it's got a good root system, you can gently take the, the little seedlings from the pots and prick them out and pot them up individually. So tip them out into your hand, then tease apart each seedling gently. Hold the seedling by a leaf or the seed leaf, the cotyledon. Don't hold it by the stem or you might crush and damage the stem. So tease the seedlings apart, take each individual seedling and then you can pot it up on its own. And this technique is called pricking out. Just put some compost into a small pot. Again, use the seed sowing compost, big dip down in the center of the pot and just ease that root system right the way down into the compost. Put more compost around the little seedling and it doesn't matter if you just bury the base of the stem as long as you keep the seed leaves just above the surface of the compost. Water from above, letting the water seep down through the compost and leave the pots in a tray so you can water them from below and top up the water as necessary. Then I put the little pots back in my heated propagator so they'll develop and you can leave these to grow on until the root system has filled the little pot and then they'll be ready to pot on into a slightly larger container. A lovely way to grow baby leaf salads in a small garden, a small space, a patio, even in a roof garden area, is to grow them in a pot. These little salads were sown about four weeks ago and within a couple of weeks they'll be ready for picking. So all you really need is a plastic tub. Plastic I find a great conserves more moisture. You could use a terracotta one, which would be a little bit heavier to lift. All you've got to do is make sure there are some drainage holes in the bottom of the container. There are lots of varieties of salads that you can grow from seeds. You've got colorful lettuces, you've got mizuna, pak choys, all sorts of little baby salad leaves, including salad mixes. 
all of them can be sown directly in a pot. You can do it for many, many months of the year. You can start off early in the year in a greenhouse or a conservatory and get the seeds growing and germinating more quickly. Good for growing crops into the autumn as well, or even during the summer, you can sow them straight into a pot. Now, as I say, I like to use a large size container and I use a peat-free compost. Just any peat-free compost will do. And you've just got to literally fill the pot up to the top with compost. Just go on adding compost, firm it down a little bit with your fingers as you go. And you just want a level surface with the top of the compost, a couple of inches, five, six centimeters from the rim of the pot. Just firm it over, level it off, then choose your favorite seed. Or you can do several different varieties all in the same pot. So today I'm going to use a little bit of mizuna, a little bit of one of the lettuce leaves, a colorful lettuce leaf, and let's have a look. Got a nice salad mix as well. Just start off by opening the packet and sprinkling some of the seeds into your hand. And you don't have to be too accurate when you're sowing salads in this way. You're not sowing them in rows, you're sprinkling them, broadcasting them over the surface of the compost. And here I'm going to sow a third of this container with lettuce. Then I'm going to use this mizuna, it's a nice salad leaf, brassica type salad. Great for picking when the leaves are still small and crisp and tasty. I start off by just putting some of the seed in your hand and then again, just sprinkle them over the top of the compost. You don't have to be too careful. Some seedlings will be close together, some will be spread apart. Just sprinkle them right over the whole surface. There we go, that's the mizuna. And lastly, I could use a colorful leaf called an amaranthus. It's a really, really pretty leaf to use in salads. Um, it's a, quite a fine seed, quite a small seed, as you can see, tiny little seeds, but just take some little pinches. And again, over the final third of this compost, I'm just sprinkling these evenly out. Don't overdo it, just try and get right well onto the edges. And there you have it, three different salad seeds in the same pot. Now you need to cover the seeds very finely with compost. And all I do is just take some handfuls of compost and just literally sprinkle them just to cover the seeds. Very, very fine mix over the surface, not deep, just very, very finely down. And you can tap the pot down as well, just literally carve it over like that, firming the surface of the compost as you go. That's all you have to do. Now, water them in. I always water from the top to start with. This helps to settle the compost around the seeds and settle the seeds down as well. So give it a really nice soaking to give it a good water. Then finally, not essential, but I like to do this. I just get a little bit of clear kitchen film and I put that over the surface of the compost. Now that stops the compost from drying out too quickly keeping the surface moist so the seeds will germinate. But once you see the little seedlings germinate, you see them emerging, just take the cling film away. And then you can water and care for the pot as usual. And as I say, within three or four weeks, you'll have a nice little spread of different salad seedlings. You can start picking them now if you want. These are delicious little tasty things. Or you can let them get a little bit bigger and pick baby salad leaves to enjoy. My blackberries are trained to this post and wire support. I've got horizontal wires about a foot apart, right the way up to almost head height. I don't want to train my blackberries in higher than I can pick them. I've pruned out all the fruited canes, 
basically the canes which carried fruit last year were cut away right down at soil level. Got the old stumps there. And all of these canes grew last year. They grew last year through the summer. They got longer and longer. These will carry fruit in the year ahead. Probably starting to flower around about July time, but continue flowering and producing fruit through July, August and September in my garden here. And all of these canes have been taken up the wire supports and trained on. I've trained them up to the top and then spiraled them down, making the most of the full length of the cane. And this will give me a complete screen here in front of my greenhouse, which will flower and carry fruits through summer, hopefully into autumn as well. Beautiful crop, crops of, uh, of, of cane fruits. Blackberries, I've got a variety called Loch Ness. I've also got some Tayberries and some Loganberries. So any of the cane fruits or the hybrid cane fruits are perfect for training up posts at either end, horizontal wires across, train the canes on, and good in small areas, compact areas, maybe to develop a screen to partition off part of your garden. Or here I grow it so it just gives a little bit of shade from the sun, which is coming in from the south, a bit of shade onto the greenhouse to keep it a little bit cooler in summer. But some really nice crops here to pick and enjoy through the summer months. If you want an early crop of potatoes, it's worth buying your seed potatoes early and then chitting the little seed potatoes and chitting basically just means placing the potatoes in a warm bright place and allowing the little baby tuber to form shoots and this just means you've started them into growth before you plant them outside by chitting them particularly your early varieties your early season varieties by chitting them before you plant it just means that they're already growing. Those little chits are going to grow into shoots and those shoots will be sending out side shoots and producing more potatoes. So by chitting them, you're going to make sure you get the earliest possible crop. Just get yourself, you know, something like an old egg carton or a seed tray or something like that. Place the um, little seed potatoes in there, put that in a warm, bright position and let the shoots grow. And then as we move through March and April in particular, you can start planting your early potatoes. This year I'm also going to be growing a really tasty uh, potato called Pink Fur Apple. So I bought these tubers and some of them are massive as you can see. And again, I'm going to get these chitted early, start these off so they've got some new shoots and then I can plant these outside the packet tells me I can be planting these from March onwards so I'll get these out for a nice early crop. When you've got a seed potato which is that big I'll probably let it form sprouts and then I'll cut it into possibly in half into two pieces maybe even into three each with a piece of potato and some shoots growing on it and that will make the most of that potato. I probably wouldn't plant that out just as a single potato. These other little baby seed potatoes just get these into growth get the sprouts going and then you can plant them out. If a seed potato produces lots of shoots, you might want to just reduce the numbers a little bit. So here on this one, I've got some at the tip and I've got some at the side. You might think actually you've got too many shoots growing on one potato and you can literally just rub off one or two. They're quite fragile, so do be careful when you're handling them and planting them out. But depending on what you want, whether you're growing them in the borders or in a big tub or a pot. Early varieties in particular, it's very important to get these chitted. Your main crop ones later in the year, not so important because they'll grow away much more quickly as you move through April and the soil conditions are warmer. But for the earliest crop from your early potatoes, especially your salad varieties, get these chitting now. With lots of seed sowing and potting to do in the spring, it's a good idea when you buy your bags of compost to move them into the shed, the greenhouse or the garage so that the compost will warm up a little bit. Don't leave the bags outside, they get frozen solid, bring them under cover and then that warm compost can be used for potting up and sowing your plants. So there you have it, lots of ideas to get your garden looking its best through the summer months, making it as productive as it can possibly be through the months ahead. 
Hopefully it's given you a few hints and tips and ideas and you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel here at Adams Gardening Guides. Check out the channel, lots of other videos for you to enjoy there. But for now, get outside, get your garden looking good for the months ahead. Happy gardening.